Hi, everyone. I hope everyone is uh, safe and healthy, which is very, very important in today's time. And uh, thank you so much for making time to join us. Um, we have a, a very uh, exciting program for you all. Uh, closing out the the uh, fall uh, winter uh, term for Taipei Cooper. So my name is Alexander. I wanted to uh, welcome everyone to the Herbal Balan Lecture Series and to today's presentation by Dr. Rathna Ramanathan, uh, Intercultural and Decolonial, uh, Exploring Frameworks for Typographic Practice. My name is Alexander. I'm one of the instructors in the Taipei Cooper program which is presenting today's talk. Uh, for those who may not be familiar, uh, Taipei Cooper is a postgraduate uh, certificate program, uh, the core of which is the study of typeface design through its two uh, dedicated programs, extended and the condensed. Uh, the lecture series is part of the extended program and runs concurrent uh, with, with the uh, the study. And we're almost to the finish line. so. To the students watching, uh, hang in there, and very excited to see your your results this uh, this term. Um, the type of Cooper program is a little bit bigger uh, beyond the two uh, dedicated programs to typeface uh, design. We also have uh, other workshops, public workshops uh, that focus on lettering, typography, and other uh, type design uh, programs. We also organize typographics conference every year. And to get more information about the program and the public workshops, some of the workshops are one day, two day, uh, 10 weeks. So there's, there's a, a big range of, of uh, offerings. Uh, to get more information, uh, just go to our website and post that in here. Uh, you can find a little bit more details about that. Uh, I uh, also wanted to direct your uh, uh, attention to the um, announcements that we have. We have a mailing list. Uh, we'll have four more lectures coming up in the spring, uh, and then we'll have four more lectures in the summer. So we usually uh, do 12 lectures every year, uh, kind of academic year, and you can get more information um, about that by going to this link. I'm going to do my, my best to multitask. Um, I also wanted to mention that this talk is being recorded and will be available later. It will be available on YouTube. It's, it's live streaming now. Uh, if you click on that uh, uh, top left uh, live icon in the, in, in the Zoom window, it says on YouTube and you can toggle that and you can select copy link and then you can uh, see the, the YouTube link. Once the webinar is over, the link stays active and you can watch back the, the presentation. Um, in a few weeks, we will have uh, an edited version uh, on Vimeo. So, and uh, I wanted to um, thank Type Culture uh, for the generosity in sponsoring the recording of this lecture to uh, help us grow the archive of talks. We have talks going back six years now. We have more than 80 lectures uh, archived, which is a phenomenal collection of, of great stuff. Um, and if you wanted to see the archive of those talks, you can check out the various albums here uh, in Vimeo, or you can go to the website, scroll down to the previous talks and click on the link. You should have an embedded video in there. So once again, my, my heartfelt thanks to Type Culture for allowing us to continue to do that. Um, just some really quick um, uh, Zoom Q&A um, notes. Uh, we will be taking uh, a live Q&A session at the end of the presentation, so send your questions using the Q&A function in Zoom. Uh, we'll try to, to see if there's anything in chat, uh, but Q&A window is the best way to send questions uh, for, for the end of the program. Uh, don't forget that uh, Zoom's chat has a toggle. There's a little blue blue button and it says who can see your message. So make sure that says everyone if you wanted to send a message to the entire group. If you uh, have it selected to um, host and panelists, which is typically the default when you uh, walk into a Zoom webinar, that's only going to be visible by the crew. So if you have a message for the crew, a technical crew, use that. But if you wanted to interact with the audience, uh, make sure it says everyone. Uh, and without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Rathna Raman, uh, sorry, 
Uh, Ramanathan is a typographer, researcher, and educator known for her expertise in intercultural communications uh, and alternative publishing practices. Uh, she's the Dean of Academic Strategy and Reader in Intercultural Communications at Central St. Martins, London. She holds a PhD in typography and graphic design, uh, graphic communication from the University of Reading. She runs her own studio, Minus Nine, and is an A Type by board member. Originally from Chennai, India, Rathna is now based in London, which is where she's joining us from. You could tell by the, the darker window uh, in, in the back. Um, she's, uh, you know, the, the beauty of Zoom uh, is we can, we can travel across the world uh, seamlessly. Uh, her research and practice are predominantly focused on the global south, uh, specifically South Asia. For the past 20 years, Rathna has headed research-led intercultural multi-platform graphic communication design projects, all fueled by the love for and lifelong interest in typography and language, um, and a belief that communication is a fundamental human right. Her talk tonight is very much shaped by those beliefs, so it is my absolute pleasure to turn it over to Rathna to present her talk, Intercultural and Decolonial, Exploring Frameworks for Typographic Practice. Sasha, um, Alexander, thank you so much for the intro introduction and also to Kara, Gabe, Miranda, who have been supporting behind the scenes and for, for the invitation to, to speak today. Um, I'm really touched by the crowd that's here and I know that some people are having breakfast as we speak and some people are having dinner and some people really should be in bed. Uh, so hopefully this will, will keep us uh, collected together um, and it really, today's talk is really about me mulling over things that I've been thinking about for the past few years and having a conversation uh, with, with some of the people in, in this room. So I want to share some of those contexts. So I'll set a little bit of context for the talk, speak briefly about why I feel we need an, an urgent rethink, and then focus on two publishing case studies to make my point. The first one is in depth, and I have to say it comes with a bit of a health warning because I get quite technical in part. So for those of you that love grids and point sizes, hurrah. For those of you that don't, maybe you want to have a little sip of water uh, and freshen your eyes. Um, and then the latter one with a little bit more of a broad overview. But I think I'm, I, I posted on my Instagram that I really hate giving talks. And then I had this wonderful conversation with, with, uh, with uh, Kara and Alexander and was completely seduced. And I think it's the conversation that really interests me. And I thought about it and I thought, why do I hate it so much? And I think it's because talks then present a view and a, a certain view. And um, as designers, perhaps we're uncomfortable with that because we hold mul a multiplicity of views. And it's also because I think that sometimes when we speak, we don't acknowledge that how we present, how we look at the world, what we think is sort of shaped by our context, our own biases and our agendas. So I want to start by giving a very brief introduction to my educational and professional practice to set a context for this. As Alexander said, I was born in Chennai, it's called Madras uh, in South India in the 1970s. And I went to an English speaking school, unlike 90% of Indian children. It was a middle class upbringing and therefore extremely privileged in the context of India. And as a child, I grew up reading books written by English or American authors because those were the books in our educational system. I work, as Alexander said, primarily with publishing as a framework on intercultural communication projects. Sometimes this is as simple as print or eBooks, and sometimes this ranges to a 100-year design research project, which we'll touch on briefly today, punctuation books about the cost, or communication-led roadshows in rural India. I'm a Dean at Central St. Martins at the University of the Arts London, and I was previously at the Royal College of Art. And as Alexander said, I did my PhD at the University of Reading. So I see myself as a really privileged and fortunate immigrant to the United Kingdom. And I have worked in two of its most elite art and design educational systems in this country. I note this so you can understand both the privilege as well as the uncertainty of the context from which I speak. To paraphrase a colleague, Ahmed Ansari, he said, many of the questions, concerns, and observations that I am to raise come from my own experiences of negotiating between East and West. 
And for me, it comes from also trying to figure out the politics of my practice as both a practitioner, a designer, and a researcher. So mustard, let's talk a bit about mustard. Um, I am, I, when I, um, coming from South Asia, life is often boundaried by scarcity and lack. And it's taken me a long while living in a, in a Northern context to understand what I see as success. I'm married to an American guy from California. And when we go to visit his family, what I love doing most is visiting an American supermarket. Because no jokes apart, I think that they offer space for reflection about life's questions. Of course, this makes me a completely useless shopper and a little bit too philosophical in a mustard aisle. But when I first visited America, I was really gobsmacked by the fact that there was so much choice available for everything. And if I'm honest, it was quite overwhelming. So growing up in India, bigger, faster, more was never thought in the South Indian context to be a mark of success. And this underlies some of the reasons for me giving this talk. I'm reminded of a time a journalist asked your fellow countryman, the amazing Toni Morrison, are you happy? Because of course we equate happiness with success. That's a really irrelevant, she replied. Why don't we just do something constructive, something creative, and then if it makes us happy, fine. But if it doesn't, at least we have tilled the garden, baked the bread, written the book. So this talk is about us as a community of people, designers, educators, doing something constructive and creative together. Now for me, this constructive work is situated in typography and graphic design. As a typographer and graphic designer who works primarily with text, when I see typography, I'm really looking at design for reading. I often hear historians emphasize the importance of written text and writing, but my primary concern is always with the reading of texts, often in multiple languages, by readers with different language capabilities and fluencies. So let me explain a little bit more. When I did my master's at St. St. Martin's many moons ago, I read texts such as these, Marshall McLuhan, Elizabeth Eisenstein, and they spoke of printing as a revolutionary agent of change that swept across Europe to the rest of the world. I studied Stanley Morrison's first principles of typography, which claimed in effect that there was only really one good way in which it could be designed. But we know a different story. We know that printing predates Gutenberg, not only by the means of xylography, whose use within and from China spread from at least 700 CE, but movable type in East Asia, metal type in Korea in the 16th century. Now in this Indian subcontinent, xylography was known long before the Jesuits introduced hand presses to South India. And the astronomy of print therefore, for me, does not describe an outwardly expanding galaxy as suggested by McLuhan, but a universe with multiple points of origin, a pluriverse, with Asia as one of its printing cradles. So I could never quite understand the concept of the crystal goblet as portrayed or communicated by Beatrice Ward. Because when you come from a context that is never neutral, this doesn't have equal relevance. And we know that every decision that the designer makes, every typeface, every image, every color, affects the message that was being communicated. So today, typography as reading for me is reading in different cultural contexts with audiences that are used to very different ways of reading. And whilst I acknowledge the importance of typography as a craft, I'm really interested in how we can use typography as a fundamental way to understand and engage with the world in mainstream and known ways, but also in experimental, marginalized, messy ways. And most of the examples I refer to today are anchored in an Indian context. And you might wonder, why is this relevant to me? Or you might look at it as a specific state case study that's simply about India. But rather than think of India as a national identity or limited geographical space, I'm interested in using India as a framework in the manner suggested here by Christopher Finney, where it becomes a site of investigation in which you can develop a model that's relevant and potentially transportable to other models and contexts. So what I'm saying is that how things might have happened 
or are happening in the Indian context could therefore be translatable or relatable to your context. And I say this because I think it's urgent that we think in this way for three reasons. The first critical issue is climate. As David Attenborough recently noted, many of the issues we face today are a result of communication or a failure of communication. How we frame things, how we speak about them, how we articulate them visually is something that we need to be accountable for as designers and typographers. And this pervades even the simplest of communication every day. So this is sculpture by Mark Wallinger, and it sits in central London, outside the London School of Economics. I went to a performance with my daughter, and as we were walking towards it, every single person, no matter what nationality, age, gender, race, who came upon it, blurted out, oh, look, it's upside down. But how can something that is a sphere be upside down? As Jared Fuller notes, this is fundamentally a graphic design issue because not only as we as artists making countless decisions, injecting a point of view to the reality we're creating, but as designers, we select these images that accompany text and we reinforce or subvert the messages being communicated. So I want us to think today about how we, each of us frames the world and the role we play in this. And what happens when we turn the tables and view the world from the perspective of the other? What changes both within us and in the context outside of us? I'd like us to keep this in mind as we share time together. The second critical issue is of the global health crisis. This is a picture of migrant workers traveling from the city to their rural homes in India. On March 24, 2020, at 8 p.m., Prime Minister Modi appeared on television to announce that from midnight onward, all of India would be under lockdown. All transport, public as well as private, would not be allowed. So a nation of 1.38 billion people was locked down with zero preparation and four hours of notice. In the words of a fellow Indian um, and writer, Arundhati Roy, the lockdown, she said, worked like a chemical experiment that suddenly illuminated hidden things. As the wealthy and the middle classes enclosed themselves in gated colonies, the towns and cities began to exclude their working class citizens, the migrant workers. Many driven out by their employers and landlords, millions of impoverished, hungry, thirsty people, young and old, men and women, children, sick, blind, disabled people with nowhere else to go, with no public transport in sight, began a long march home to their villages. They walked for days and some of them never made it home. Among older people, it evoked memories of the population transfer of 1947 when the British divided the subcontinent and Pakistan was born. But as Roy notes, this current exodus was driven by class divisions, not religion. And what does it mean when we say work from home when people are homeless? The third issue is of truth. I'm sorry to bring back a bit of American political history past that I'm sure that we want to go away, but look at the British present that we have to live with. So I'm bringing us all into the same game. The third issue for me is that of truth. There is speak in recent years of alternative facts, but anyone from an oppressed or called society will note that alternative facts have existed as long as we have been writing history. And this is after all the basis of colonization, to present reality in a manner which suits one's own power, needs and context. This is a quote on Indian education in 1835 by Thomas Macaulay. He was an eminent British historian and was in charge of introducing English concepts to Indian education. And this remark, this report that he dismissed Indian notions of knowledge on the basis of their difference. In Macaulay's view, the world was divided into civilized nations and barbarism. And he notes that there are no books on any subject in India that deserve to be compared to European texts. And he goes on to refer to Indian history, astronomy, medicine, and religion as false, thereby dismissing and rendering useless hundreds of years of knowledge. The colonial legacy is a painful one. And I'll give you an example. 
This is Hortus Malabaricus, meaning Garden of Malabar. And it's a comprehensive treaty that deals with the properties of the flora of the Western Ghats in India, covering Kerala, Karnataka, and Goa. It's written in Latin and it was compiled over 30 years and it was conceived by Henrik van Reed, who was the governor of Dutch Malabar at the time. It contains about 720 pen and ink wash drawings of different species and is accompanied by a detailed description of each. The plant names I included, you could see them on the top left in Malayalam, Konkani, Urdu and English. But the process was described as such. All around the country, wrote Van Reed, was diligently searched by natives best acquainted with the habitats of plants. And then fresh specimens were brought to Cochin where the Carmelite Matthias sketched them. Now the power dynamic about the construction of knowledge is visualized in the frontispiece on the left. Look at where everybody's sitting, look at the font of knowledge as it's described. What is deeply troubling about this text is that whilst it was collated and compiled by natives as they refer to Indian experts in the field, it was only available in Latin till the 21st century. So this text has been largely inaccessible because it was not available in any Indian language. So here you have knowledge about India written with Indian knowledge that is inaccessible to Indians themselves. Now the origins of publishing and printing in India are enabled with colonial ambitions. Boventure de Sousa Santos tells us that these ambitions sought, sought to discredit, erase, or appropriate the knowledges of the global South with the aim of contributing to a dominant global North knowledge and culture. So imagine that your language is Tamil and imagine that the first time you see your language in print is to communicate a text that is almost alien to your culture. And imagine the power that is contained in this act of publishing to use someone's language to represent back to them a culture and a religion that is not their own. So who decides what is knowledge and who this knowledge is for? What is knowledge if language and visual form prohibit people from accessing them? And what role do we play in this as designers and typographers who frame knowledge for access, for reading? Now, small point to note here uh, is that from a typographic and linguistic perspective, these first printings of Tamil with early metal type often limited, often omitted the pulli or the virama and the dot, which was really essential to Tamil language. So it changes the way that content is represented. So essentially this is typographically incorrect. Now Ahmed Ansari tells us that decolonizing entails not only a political position, but a knowledge-based one. And in order for us to understand our present, we have to engage with the colonial and also the pre-colonial past. And we had just the opportunity to do this for a project called the Murti Classical Library of India. This is a hundred year publishing project that was started by Rohan Murthy, who was inspired by his own experience of education in India. And it is one that I and many urban Indians identify with. The text, as I mentioned, that Rohan and I studied in school was Shakespeare and comedies and tragedies poems from Wordsworth and Shelley. But sadly missing from it was the same opportunity to partake of our own classics and heritage. The Murthy Classical Library of India aims to make the literary works of India from the past two millennia to address some of this balance. Many classical Indian texts have never reached a global audience and are inaccessible to Indian readers. So this series provides modern English translations many for the first time, alongside a vast number of Indian languages. And there were several design challenges to this project. The first was at the time of the inception of the Murthy Library, no typefaces existed that could set the range of characters in the text in a manner that was readable and accessible. So Harvard Press commissioned a series of Murthy typefaces designed specifically for the library, were designed by Fiona Ross and John Hudson. And this is available more widely today. You can read more about the process of research and design on the Murti Classical Library website. And Fiona has written about this as well. 
We also use Titus Nemitz Nassim and De Decotypes Nastalik to set some of the text. Now with multilingual typefaces, which work within English text, we often aim to translate size, style, or color. And we try to harmonize or match the so-called non-Latin with the Latin. But with the Murti library, the type designers prioritize design integrity, providing typefaces that could stand on their own without deferring to existing Latin models. The challenge of this project for me was to find a contemporary design solution to the classical text while retaining their spirit and originality. And my work on this project consisted of book design, interior book design frameworks for 30 bilingual volumes, as well as design and typographic guidelines in prose and poetry for Indian languages such as Abramasha, Abadi, Bengali, Hindi, Kannada, Pali, Punjabi, Prakrit, Sanskrit, and Telugu, using Bangla, Devanagari, Gurmukhi, Kannada, and Telugu scripts with the typefaces designed by John and Fiona. Now, for me, the project was important and critical for two main reasons. The first was this statement made by Sheldon Pollock, who was the editor of the series. And he identified a critical need to address the situation or else Indians and the rest of the world would not have access to India's classical heritage. And as English slow dominates the Indian landscape, the generations that speak and write Indian languages are slowly disappearing. Additionally, vernacular texts are very rarely affordably available for reading. The second is a quote by Deshmukh, who refers to a lack of attention to printing and typographic conventions in India. In the process of the design and research, I realized that there are no accepted published guidelines or standards for typographic setting in Indian languages. So the project relies heavily on primary archival resources, secondary materials for the design of text. And a part of the project also became about researching and building these guidelines to share them freely. And while there's substantial progress in the availability of robust, good quality typefaces for Indian languages, this serves a limited purpose when we don't have clear typographic guidelines of use that can accompany them. Now, in 2011, British designers Schultz and Tina Arnold wrote about something that they call change through making. And they noted that what we need to keep in mind is that we as designers can design the means through which design happens, challenging the concepts, behaviors, and the means of production as well as designing form. So the chance to be a part of the Moti Library gave us an impetus for such an opportunity to begin to form a series of guidelines for Indian typography. Now, one of the challenges of a 100-year project is that it's essential that the system or the standards that are being created by us survive us, that they make sense to people beyond us, and that it provides whomever takes this on in the future with a really strong foundation to build on. So the design act was to design text, but also to design a system that would outlive us. But how do you do this? How do you reconstruct a past when you weren't around in it? And how do you plan for a future that is beyond your own lifetime? And for me, the answer lies in Nancy Ferris's uh, text where she talks about combining system with process. So as designers, we know that systems fit parts together in a way that is described by the function of what they do. And process links them together sequentially through the cause and effect, so it adjusts to that. So we need to see the relationship of design in motion, continually changing, but also staying integrated and linked to that system. So one of our first tasks were to find a compatible Latin typeface for the books. So together we put a list of criteria. And in addition to this criteria, I was really keen that we had a robust typeface that could flourish with the best that American printing had to offer, but also withstand printing and paper and weather conditions in India. So we selected a short list of typefaces and then conducted a number of tests in relation to certain Indic typefaces that we had. And here we really focused on the comparative relationship 
between the two texts rather than any microtypographic detail. We chose Henry Klubel's Antwerp, which is a classical and contemporary text typeface with historical references. It has a generous X height that allowed for reading on the printed page, but also on multiple number styles, a large set of ligatures and fractions, large punctuation that was prominent and really pronounced ink traps. It could be set in really small sizes and work equally well as footnotes, but also as display type. And because the series adheres to Indic conventions of a single weight, the Latin typeface needed really to have a distinctive Roman and italic that would have both flex and opacity. And I'll talk a little bit more about this as we go along. But first, I need to think about the book design concept, because in India, you have different languages and genres that this design had to accommodate. So the starting mission was 13 different languages and relevant scripts. And I was really drawn to my childhood and the concept of unity and diversity, which is promoted strongly in India and exemplified by the national anthem that's written by Tagore. And this became a guiding principle for the interior design to exemplify the best of the scripts at the same time being relevant to the needs of the larger series. Now for the purpose of the book design, we divided the scripts into three subgroups not South and Persia Arabic. And the aim, as I said, was to establish a series of typographic conventions for poetry as well as for prose. We did and continue to do a tremendous amount of archival research, looking at manuscripts and early printed books in India to give us a breadth and scope of knowledge, focused particularly on the pre-1800 period. And this consists not only of looking at objects to mimic them, but looking at historical objects, having a conversation with the makers over the years and interrogating the context in which they were produced so that we better understand why design decisions were made. It's also important to acknowledge that the history of the book tradition in India, as we know, is not the codex, it's the scroll or the manuscript. And while the Murti books are currently printed in the form of the codex, there is an ambition to provide digital success. So access. So we did not want to get too stuck to this idea of the codex. Now, textual content, as we know, is shaped by form, the tools, the materials, and the technology that produce this form. With the introduction of printing in India, very tangled with colonial ambitions, we also needed to unravel this context and to be very careful to pull out implicit understandings of how the text should be set. Now, it was really important to note that if we felt like we were building something new, this was definitely not the case. What we were doing was reforming what existed for today's con contemporary reader in a multilingual and intercultural context. So we were acting like interpreters and translators. And finally, we had to acknowledge the place of English in an Indian context where many Indians are bilingual, where we're used to seeing English accompany Indian languages. Now the Murti library has a strict aim of reaching as wide an audience as possible. And this means people coming to the text for different reasons. They might come to it to study or they might come to it for the play of reading. And also these readers could be fluent in the language. They might be second language speakers or third language speakers, or they may not read English at all. And it was really important that equal access was provided for all of these readers. Now in India, reading is a public and social activity. Benedict Anderson tells us that reading is a private activity that happens in our skulls, invisible from public scrutiny or intrusion. But this is not the case in India where there was and still is a very sophisticated oral culture and a belief that unscripted communication is an indication of your ability as well as your sincerity. There's a belief that what is written can always be read, but what is meant to be heard must be spoken and lived. Here's an example of the four Vedas that were off authored in 1500 BCE. They were transmitted orally from generation to generation with absolute accuracy. This is the Rig Veda, which has about 10,000 verses of four lines each, and has been orally preserved for about three and a half millennia. 
not only do the words need to be repeated exactly, but there's a particular rhythm, cadence, and sonority that needs to be replicated if the verses are to carry their spiritual charge. So this is based on the belief that the sounds of words signify as much as the words themselves. So how does a classical library value these traditions equally? The design challenge was described by Dr. Sharmila Sen in Harvard University Press in one of our first meetings. So the aim was to get the Muthi text to be perceived with the same lack of boundaries as Indian classical music, where the enjoyment of the text is not limited by the origin of the text. Now music polyphony is a texture that consists of two or more melodic voices. So we took an approach to the book design that asked two questions. Can we design a book where the concept of symmetry is based on language rather than on aesthetics? And can the content lead the form, but still create a well-balanced and pleasing design? So what happens here is that the book design adjusts according to the language and the relationship of the two languages to each other in terms of the length. And this system highlights the individual nature of each of the texts and puts the languages in relation to each other as well. So I'm going to get technical a little bit for three slides to explain what we did. Using one of six different widths, the text box could be placed on the page in 28 different ways. As the two languages don't have to be the same width, you can have further variations. So for example, I could use B one to seven for the English and C two to seven, for example, for the Tamil. Ideally, every language or genre would only have one set of combinations that could then be applied to all the subsequent titles in that language. Through the flexibility of column widths, interlinear spacing and type size, the series then provides for different structures of text, such as poetry prose, but also drama sometimes. And it follows the arrangement of the original text and translation to their best internal logic, and then focuses on providing a smooth bilingual reading experience. So this is an example of the Devanagari Latin spread where the grid divides the page from an inner margin into multiples of nine. The positioning of the elements then varies according to language and length. And the system aims to highlight the nature of the text and puts an emphasis on the intertextuality. We found that the best method to approach the design was to embrace the difference of the different languages, which made for irregular settings in multi-script editions much more feasible. But this meant that the characteristics of the script called for greater interlinear space, sometimes a larger body size, to, to have the best effect of each script with the reader in mind. And each page also has a subtly different layout that's determined by the length of the Indian language in relation to the English and the nature of the scripts to each other. So here the Hindi poem is set 14 on 7.5 points and on a one and a half uh, baseline measure to the Latin, which is set nine on 14. And rather than try to push or find an exact same harmony between the two very different scripts, we just aim to acknowledge the difference openly and try and find a synchronicity in the reading. Here in the story of Manu, the challenge was to ensure that the color of the pages was correct. And Fiona and I conducted a number of print tests together to ensure that all of the typefaces reached this optimum relationship. The history of Akbar was set by, typeset by Titus using Nassim. And you can see here the particular challenges that he has faced and how he has pushed the margins and the template to achieve as beautiful a relationship of reading between the two pages. Now, this is um, Terigata, which is a text uh, about um, Buddhist women. And what happens here is that when, in, when we're working with publishing, there's a lot of constraints and economical constraints that we, that creative decisions have to sort of arise from them. As noted with these typefaces, because of the classical text tradition with the index, there's no bold index, there's no slanted, there's no other weights. And with multi-script setting, because of the lots of difference in the articulation and the hierarchy, devices used in English text, such as bold, small caps, italics, letter spacing, 
really represent a challenge in representing the same information in the Indic text. So we took the approach not to mimic the hierarchies and to be true to the heritage of the text. So sometimes what we did was we resorted to color. So you could see the comment text that's below the headline is an 80% gray. And this is something that we found could be achieved both with Indian printing as well as American printing, particularly with different bulks of paper. Achieving typographic compatibility was another challenge, particularly with complex footnotes. And the reader of these notes is definitely likely to be a high level scholar or a student who is studying the text. So it's essentially a reader who wants a really no nonsense sentence that reads smoothly and clearly across both languages. Now, as a typographer, you feel a bit of creative tension when designing the setting. You're constantly aware of the different audiences, the origins of the text, as well as the contemporary reader. And in the process of the design, it was not unusual uh, for John, Fiona or I to be contacted by the translators asking for a change in the typeface so that it closely resembles the treatment of the ligature in what they would call the original. But this idea of originality was sometimes misplaced because the typefaces are being used for more than just a single text. And there's a query here in relation to India's print history. What is the original? Is it the first printed edition? Is it the manuscript? There's, there's this chase for it that doesn't quite make sense. And this balance of what we were trying to achieve with all of these different tensions and thoughts was captured in a review of the text, The Epic of Ram. The review was written by Rupert Snell, an eminent pro professor of Asian studies. Now it's important in translation to be as authentic and close to the text as is feasible. However, the design of this text departed for reasons of reading. And in his review, as he reflects through the design, Snell account acknowledges something that's really important for us today. That some of the practices that we follow today are because they're habitual, because we're comfortable with them, because we've known them, and because they have become every day, and not necessarily because they have a genuine history. So I think that it's really important that we question this as we go along. Now, the Murti project is not just about the spirit of the design process but is about change through making and about the impact of through design on an everyday situation. The typefaces used in the project are available to anyone working in the Indian context. The books are being brought back into universities. They're published both as paperbacks and affordable paperbacks and hardbacks. So the Indian public can access them as well as an international audience. As Sheldon Pollock said, we need new ways of describing the world that's not just a European tradition. And this library with its design, its production and its literary approach in all aspects is just a small step towards that. So this is a process about developing and sharing an approach to typography in the Indian context. But the aim, as I said at the start, is not just to show its relevance to India and not just to non-Latin, but more broadly to the practice of typography. Because such a typography then acknowledges all periods of textual history and not just the dominant ones or the easily accessible ones. I'd like to focus the last 10 minutes of my presentation on Tara Books, an Indian publisher that I work with. Founded in 1994 by a group of writers and designers committed to egalitarian principles, Tara Books was interested in changing the perspective of which stories are told. And this meant expanding the notion of authorship, the notion of the book and what makes content in a book and the role that design plays in the publishing process. Now the books are a result of collaborations with unusual talent from really unlikely places. And Tara's aim is to reflect this richness and breadth of the perspectives that comes into their books. My design journey was formed in part by Tara for whom I've designed books for many years now. And through Tara, I learned a different way of practice. I learned that making and designing and producing a book is based on community. That publishing is a collaborative exercise where the success of a book cannot be attributed to one indig individual as we have seen with the Murti library. So it's always felt very odd that we consider sole achievement because our profession by nature is dialogic, 
collective and heavily dependent on the work of others at every stage. Tara saw India's rich, um, popular and vernacular art traditions were missing from Indian books. So their mission was to enter into this territory and to re reject misogynistic, casteist or racist content, but also to challenge the dull moralizing children's books that had become the norm in India at that time. When I asked the publisher Geeta Wolf, um, she remarked that it was a conversation that she was looking at. Sasha, everything okay? And she remarked that it was a conversation between the book and the reader, but also importantly behind the people who make the book and design the, the books. She notes that at our books, we think of the book as a moment in time, as a picture of a much longer process. Now, in the case of the Murti Library, uh, we've seen a different kind of culture. Here with the promised land, this is a conversation between cultures and a collaboration between two people from very different walks of life. I see the promised land tells the story of Martin Luther King Jr. through the Patua art of Manu Chitrakar and the words of the writer and storyteller Arthur Flowers. It's a graphic novel that links the Bengali scroll tradition with contemporary texts and came about as a conversation between Arthur and Manu. Now Martin Luther King Jr. dedicated most of his adult life to the idea that all people should be equal. And it feels fitting that a work about his life would be an intercultural approach. The work with Tara Books has also been about giving a voice to marginalized people who don't normally get a voice. And I worked on this book, The Nun and Jungle Book, with the brilliant Gond artist, Badu Sham. And it is titled both as a homage and a mirror counterpoint to Kipling's The Jungle Book, which tells the story essentially of Badu's journey from London uh, to London from India. It has a layer of historical significance. A century earlier, Baju's tribe was studied by a British anthropologist who then married a Gond woman and wrote several books about the tribe. Baju's grandfather had been Elvin's servant, so he'd grown up with the writer's story. And the London Jungle Book was summarized by Baju with a brilliant decolonial statement. Elvin Saab, he said, wrote about my tribe and now it's man to write about his. With a sophisticated reading culture, Tara has exposed, explored this aspect of India through multiple ways in their books. They often ignore market and convention. They use the book to tell important stories, um, such as this, The Boy Who Speaks With Numbers, which is a satiric account of childhood in the times of war. And the events that it narrates could equally happen elsewhere in all places where human deaths are reduced to numbers and guns don't differentiate between adults and children. The other way of expanding uh, reading is through typography. Tara sees typography, as Michael Berwick noted, as a way of understanding and engaging with the world. And their approach challenges conventions of image and text and blur the boundaries of what image and text should do. So this gave us a chance to explore voice and tone and accent, context, each designed to reflect the Indian world around the book rather than just the original text. Now publishers like Tara challenge the publishing process by also asking the designer to have a voice. My approach to typography and publishing is less about the crystal goblet and about where I grew up, the big visuals and the billboards in India, so I see typography both as text and image and as a visual colorful language in its own right. And I feel that it's a design in typography that helps us situate universal narratives within a local context. This is a 1928 German poem about politics, oppression and war that's recontextualized in a modern Indian setting and brought back to life. The book then becomes a research space to understand the politics that surrounds typography and language. And by politics, I mean the power that aesthetics that visual and typographic can carry as language and voice. So this is really about using typography to include people rather than exclude them and give those without a voice a chance to have one. The role of typography as Gita explains it can be loud or it can hold the book together or elevate it like a third voice. Now, India during the 1970s was marked by a strong relationship with Russia. 
and Russia helped India launch its first satellite. So children like myself in India had access to a lot of children's books in, uh, from Russia, and this didn't seem quite out of place. So when we were working on in the land of punctuation, this analogy came up and it felt important to challenge the notion that a German poet should only be published by a German author, uh, publisher. And what mattered more, we felt, was depth and intention in an intercultural approach. Research played a very key role in establishing a sense of context, in us understanding and embedding a sense of authenticity within the design. And we all undertook the research over three years using different resources. One was this, looking at type play and type image in a number of archives and analyzing the use of typography in Morgan Stone's time. We investigated the industrial production of typography and language, much like the context of Morgan Stone's poem, paying attention to the manner in which letterpress and typography could be used to convey social and political themes. And then we looked at photographic documentation of war and jump, the visual imagery that says in one's mind and speaks in one's mind, even if we are unfamiliar with the firsthand experience of war. And typography, testing and exploring different typefaces, some historically relevant, some conceptually relevant uh, to Morgan Stern's poem and context. So the pages draw from cultural references, a calendar mobile, a remembered scene from a film. And I suppose the experiment was that with the text was to see whether pearl memories and references could be relatable to the different generations would come to the book and read their own context. Research provided the necessary navigation for the practice. So some spreads are quite typographically or photographically representative as the Nuremberg rally or the bombs falling from the sky, and others were inspired by the nature of the text itself. In order for us to address the global challenges such as climate, health, or fake news, I argue that we need frameworks that cross cultures and contexts. How does one build a decolonial and intercultural framework for typographic practice? For me, the first is through the depth and interrogation of research. Research not as an elite academic activity, but as a daily human practice. A genuine need and a compulsion to know and understand each other and cultures that are not known or understood by us. Research as a fundamental human act as described by Arjuna Padura here. Second, it's not working alone. All of the work that I have solely presented today is the result of working very closely in cooperation with multiple people across the world. People who have a depth of knowledge about their practices and disciplines and are seeking to learn from others who are not like themselves. These intercultural frameworks are not built in isolation, but in practice with others. And the third is to understand the politics of our tools. Everything we touch and shape has an action beyond us. So we need to hold ourselves both accountable but empower ourselves with this understanding of how we shape the world. We have known that design is ideological. We know that the design process, as Dun and Raby have told us, is informed by values that space that are based on our worldview, our way of seeing and understanding reality. We need to understand that nothing we do is neutral. It's informed by who we are and how each of us in turn has been shaped. As D'Souza Santos challenges us, this means that we need to look at resetting and reshaping the basis of what we now call knowledge and this. It needs to consider what is knowledge, what we might call typography or design, and how do we frame this, whether this is theory or whether this is practice, and for what purpose or what success. Let us go back to Toni Morrison's remark about doing constructive work. For me, the work is in this belief that drives my practice, my teaching and my research, that communication is a fundamental human right, that every human on this earth deserves to be communicated to and with, and be able to communicate with others in a form, a tone, a script, a language with truth and ethics in a way that's appropriate and relevant to all of us. Thank you so much for listening and being with me this morning, evening, and thank you once again to Kupatite, Alexander and Cara for the invitation to speak.
Thank you so much. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really fascinating to see this process. And I, I really appreciate the way that you walked us through all of these projects and in such detail to kind of give, give the audience like a really uh, an invaluable uh, lens into how this sort of work can be done, especially in, in the time we're living in today. And I, I really thank you for that. Um, I want to ask and remind everyone uh, if you have questions to send them through the Q&A window. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll take a few minutes to read some questions and, and, and answer some. Um, let me see if there's any um, that have come in. Um, there's a question from Jenny, um, Jenny Swadosh. Uh, I work in a university special collection repository in New York City. Our undergraduate students are very eager to access primary sources documenting India's design history. Do you have favorite archival databases and online sources I can share with them uh, when they ask for help? Your slides were inspiring. That's a fantastic question. And I think that um, we struggle with that a lot. I'd say that it's, it's, it's um, it's largely a colonial collection. I think that a lot of it exists in, in different parts of the world. And I'd say it's part of the reason that I came here to study as well in the UK to have access to those collections uh, a lot. I think the Smithsonian holds some of it. The Sembright Library is a great resource. The British Library is the one that we've relied on quite a lot in, in, in this. Um, and I'd say that also the SOAS Library. So I'd say that perhaps, um, to approach something like Indian typography and design is perhaps to look a little bit more broadly than where we would normally look in terms of uh, Western typographic resources. So look at language books, look at objects themselves and learn from objects themselves, I, I would say would be equally useful um, as, 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 as reading texts that people have, have written. I think that, um, there's the non Latin at the, at the University of Reading holds a substantial amount. And I think that there have been texts that have been published there uh, from authors there that, are, that I would say, I would highly, highly recommend as, 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 a, as a starter. But thank you for asking that question. It's a really difficult one. And if anybody else has tips, please, please do send them into the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a very interesting thing to think about, especially as there's more and more visual content on, online available and, and, you know, just just sort of the constant stream of, of things being being exposed and especially with the, uh, the emphasis being placed on shifting the focus away from kind of the, the Euro uh, Western centric um, hubs of, 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 of visual culture and seeing kind of more uh, alternative or maybe it shouldn't be alternative, but certainly kind of the, the off the canon kind of stuff. And the thing that I often kind of struggle with is because of the, just the nature of how visuals are appropriated and absorbed into, into kind of a Western context. Like my fear is always like the more, uh, the sort of the wider lens we get, the, the more appropriation will sort of inevitably kind of yeah. happen. And, and, you know, do you see, um, you know, projects like, um, like what's, what would you see perhaps like a, a good way to, um, I don't know, stem a little bit of that uh, nature within design to appropriate visuals as, and, and kind of commodify them? Is, is it through sensitivity to the subject? Is it through kind of historical study? I think it's both. I think that what helps, I think that with, with, with the Indian context, because the classical is always contemporary, you're, it's always reminding you it's, it's there and it's alive. And I think that that ownership is, is, is yours. So history belongs to all of us as, as, as a ministry. So I think that link between who we're designing for helped anchor the audience that we're designing for, but also the context in which. So for me, it helped to have a lot of imaginary conversations with the invisible hands that had put together Indian ephemera, people who had designed things before and had faced that context before and to learn from that. So I feel that in art and design practice, perhaps we don't value the visual practice and what we learn from the visual practice as, as much as we do with theoretical practice. And I think that perhaps there's a task there for us in terms of how we speak about our objects and how we articulate our objects. Um, that, is, that is aesthetic because aesthetics can have power uh, as, as well but also to be generous in sharing that process. I think that that for me 
really understanding, uh, understanding that. And I think when you go into an archive, you have the pleasure of looking through that process or seeing correspondence or, or things. So I think, A, I would say document our own practice. Don't be shy to do that because, you know, things are disappearing. You know, we, we would be having this conversation together in person and here we are, you know, on a chat. So, so I think if anything, the pandemic taught us is not to take that for granted. I think keep having those conversations. Um, it's okay to feel foolish. I felt foolish quite a lot, you know, coming into a British context from an Indian context and being being open open to that. Um, and I think that's that's just really it. I've I've been um, anchored and and sort of enlivened by the people that I work with and those conversations. So a little bit of a greedy thing, really, that you're feeding you're feeding ourselves with these different resources. Some of them imaginary conversations with objects that are before us. Some of them in, in, in the words of people who have thought very carefully about, about those. And then conversations like this that we're having having today and, and people are having in, in, in the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I really appreciate the, the kind of dynamic that we can have uh, through one, one, you know, having opportunities to bring people and, 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 and you know, kind of come together and and have a, a very robust kind of interaction where it doesn't feel can, it doesn't feel sort of uh, uh, captured, even though it's like we're we're watching each other on a screen and doesn't it doesn't feel so so stilted. Yeah, and I appreciate everyone like uh, posting links and and thank you, John, for John Hudson to to for adding a few few links in the chat. So I hope everyone is, is able to see that. Um, and uh, John Barry actually um in, in just asked um. So we're talking about some of these Sunday books. Uh, how easily available are the Murti mm -hmm. uh, volumes outside of India? And what about Tara books as well? Um, pretty easily available in lots of bookstores. And I'm a great supporter of, of independent bookstores rather than you know what. <laughs> uh, so you can get them on you know what, but we won't give them any airspace on, on this. Um, so I'd say that also... Um, it's great to just contact the, the publishers themselves because both, both Hubbard and uh, Tara send them out to you. And then you get this, this physical act of someone just having wrapped those for you, you know, and, and you might get some goodies that you wouldn't really get if you were, if, if you were buying them uh, from you know what. Yeah. yeah. Important yeah. to support independent publishing and certainly independent bookstores and distribution. So it's it's uh, yeah. And there's a lot a lot out there, uh, not just the big ones. Um, there's actually there's an interesting question from Joy uh, mm -hmm. uh, was was in the chat and then uh, Joy uh, um, framed the question. Um, uh, do you ever consider? Um, I guess this is sort of in, in relationship to the Marte Library, um, the classic mm -hmm. library. Do you ever consider having the original text translated into all of the languages in the project, creating books that included many languages, not just the original in English, so that each reader could read the text in the original and in the, her native language, as well as in all the other languages, including English. Yeah, I think that uh, Joyce probably had a peek into the mind of Sheldon Pollock, actually, because that is the dream of the project, is to, is to do that. Is, is, um, uh, but I think that perhaps our act is a bit easier, the design act is a bit easier than the translation act. Uh, but I think that was the, the real intention, is that digitally, essentially on your phone, because that's the really ubiquitous form of receiving information, particularly in India. Um, and, and mobile technology is, is much more affordable, quite honestly, than a, than a book, is to make, make it trans translatable into, into a language that you would, you know, let's say your first, so, so um, a Hindi text into, let's say Tamil, because that's my, my native language. So that is the dream of the project. I'm guessing that it would be um, a digital, um, project rather than a printed one because uh, it's pretty exorbitant in terms of the, the books and even the price of a, a book is probably about a week's worth of groceries really for, for, for you know um, class Indians so even though it's affordable it, there, it, there is something uh, there about access so I think there is a lot of thinking about both translating into multiple languages, but also in, in terms of um, where it appears and how people access that. Right, yeah. Yeah, certainly kind of the margins for book publishing are, are never 
never fantastic mm-hmm. as anyone uh, involved mm-hmm. in publishing will tell you um, and, and sort of balancing that digital access with with uh, physical access but obviously there's this immense pleasure in having a physical object that that uh, uh, slows you down and, and just kind of lets you focus mm-hmm. on the object at hand yeah there's a, a much more um i don't know just a a a, a, a magical immersive experience with a physical object that certainly yeah, that absolutely. A digital device but um yeah i think it's 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 interesting to think about and and certainly i think this is something that was kind of mentioned in the chat this like the the beautiful idea of a hundred year project you know like that that it's something that uh has kind of moved away you know it's something that that uh we, we don't really have anymore but i think it's a really wonderful no. way of thinking about things like long term I think that that's, I'm glad you, you said that um, actually, because we spent a lot of time thinking about the book and it's being read. So the hardback actually lays flat. Um, it does have a marker. So it's, it's so that it's open. The margins are reasonably generous for people to mark them and use them uh, quite, quite a bit. Um, and, you know, the size and all of that was, was thought through in that way with the paperbacks. Also, they, they, they can be kind of cracked up and they're quite light so that they're easy, easier to sort of carry. So I think, yes, reading, but also kind of access to reading and what you're saying actually there in terms of that materiality of the object itself, the physical usable object that we still haven't managed to surpass in its design and, and you know, how, how we kind of tend, tend to that. Um, but also perhaps to make it less... Um, hierarchical perhaps of or you know to reduce the power of that object because I think in a context with different literacies it can be quite intimidating as well so how do how do we make that a little bit more reachable and I think yeah so that anybody can can take it and, and, and flip a book and, and look at it mm-hmm. there's a couple of questions I, I do want to make sure that we get uh, through them, we have we have a few minutes left. Um, um, the next three questions, uh, there's no name attached to them, but uh, I'll, I'll just start with the first one that came in. Uh, could we possibly address the badge of casteism and religious hegemony associated with uh, some of these classic texts? Is there a critical stance design can take? That's a probably a more complex question. So I think that the, um, the editorial team has considered that. And if I'm honest, if I look at the text, because you have to read them as you're, as you're setting them, um, it does, the, the choice of the text is really about breaking some of those assumptions. So there was a real thought about, for example, Terigata is, you know, the poems of the first Buddhist women, you know, and I think that you don't think of, so, so there's a real sense of that, not just, there's caste, but also gender bias or, you know, racial bias and, and sort of working with, with, with those. So I'd say that there's a real, how should I put it, a secular approach to, to the text in, in, in their selection and in their translation, um, but also pretty extensive footnotes that sort of set that in context as, as well and end notes that set that in context. So I'd say that it's, um, and I think that that's something that, keeping the contemporary reader in mind that we learn from that heritage, but also we learn to critique that, that, that heritage um, is very much a, not just a part of the designs, but very much a part of the editorial stance as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and there's two uh, slightly more technical, I guess, like t- typeface questions out um, regarding the you know, Indian languages that currently don't have their own scripts when laying out the Murti classic books, did you consider different typefaces compared to the English translation when dealing with those languages to distinguish them in some way? And are there efforts to create new scripts at the moment? I think I'll have to defer to Fiona and, and, and John here, but yes, I think that um, as scripts are needed, typefaces will be created. And that was the original, you know, that was the premise of it. I think also I'd say that uh, for John and also Hendrik, um, there's there's a generosity about what is the typeface because you know I think that Fiona and John have done an extensive look um, at you know the historical use of of um, and the characters there, but if we do come across one that isn't there, then we do update the typeface. So the typeface in itself is a living archive of the project. It's a design archive of the project as it's, as it's progressing. Um, and I think, like I said, it's not just about the text themselves, but the impact that the design can have on the, the, 
you know, the Indian sort of cultural and, and how other people would use it. So there would be, yeah. Um, the, the usual Harvard series has only two or three, like, you know, the Aitati and the Loeb have two or three languages. We've already touched, I think, 13. So, you know, we've, we're, we're already well on the way, way to that. And some of those are, I'd say, dialects as well as languages. So there's, you know, it's a bit more complicated than, than, than the main languages. So the main languages are paid attention to. I can see Fiona as well has given us a slight note of, I think, pragmatism, which is welcome, that we shouldn't be like translating this into all of the languages because there are hundreds of them, but the modern in languages of India that are accessible, um, that, that, that's, a, that's a sensible way to, to go. And I think that um, there is, I think there is a South Indian text that's, that's the typeface that's being prepared uh, as we speak, which I think John and Fiona may or may not be able to speak to, but I think also, I think John's speaking about um, the documentation of the typeface design and the thinking behind that. So that generosity again about the process and, and how you go about a complex design process is really important for us to share because um, this work can't be done with a sense of proprietorness, but, but done with a sense of, of sharing and, and thinking aloud about all of the problems that we might be facing as we kind of go along. Yeah, and then John mentioned, I think earlier in the chat that um, the, the typefaces are available for non-commercial use on the website, which, which really yeah. uh, speaks to that greater generosity of, 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 of sharing this, this material. And, and Fiona's just uh, added the typefaces focus on readability for sustained reading, which I think. Yeah. yeah, and I think that that reading is also, you know, that for me, some of the texts are really difficult to read because they're not in a language that I'm familiar with. That's probably a third language that I learned in, in India, but so I might be a very slow reader or I might be a really like, you know, um, expert reader that's really studying this at university and that sustained reading has, has, has been, you know, both, I'd say. Um, we have, what we haven't done is publish the email archive of this, process, of this whole project. And I think that's going to be interesting to do about all of the conversations that we've had and the, and the kind of tussles that we've had to reach that. Yeah. But I think what has been of real value is the value that design was given in this process was really humbling, that it was given equal emphasis to the editorial or the translation or, you know, um, so production and design was very much so. And I think therefore that wonderful collaboration happened between, you know, Fiona, John and, and myself and, and Guglielmo and Titus as, as well, um, who, who then inherited the template and flex the languages and the scripts he was set in. Mm -hmm. There's, there's a related question to that uh, and and also add a note that like you know certainly kind of archiving the, the all of the process material uh, goes back to what you were saying earlier about like making sure this, um, the process and the thinking is preserved for um, because that builds future future projects future investigations so hopefully at one one point it'll be it'll be somewhere available uh, I'll read this this last question because um, I think we're, we're we have just enough time for one more uh also there's there's no uh, name to the question but i'll read the question discussing your method of designing you mentioned combining process-oriented work with systematic approaches i appreciate this because often graphic design experimentation is deemed separate from and inferior to designing uniform mm -hmm. system does process come before establishing a system is one aspect of this work prioritized or do you approach this differently it's a very good question it's a really good question I think it's a conversation between both because you can't have one without the other. So there is inflexible, a system cannot be inflexible nor can the process be inflexible. So it's, it's them speaking to each other with let's say a sort of left and, and right brain. I'm sort of reminded of the job that I do now which is a Dean of Academic Strategy and where being a graphic designer comes into real play um, is I think that I would say that the framework or this for me is the strategy, what holds it together and what's the purpose that holds it together. And then the detail is the delivery of, of what we do. So it's very similar in teaching. We think about the process of, of why we're doing what we're doing and then the micro details of it that, that, that come together. So I'm a great one for actually thinking of systems as being experimental themselves. Um, and I think that in, in Tamil, we have a saying, which is this and that, not this or that. 
So I think that you take both collectively in a in an Indian situation rather than than one or the uh, the other. So sometimes you value the system and you say, actually, you know what, we can't make this happen, and that helps us draw some design constraints when you're setting a text. And sometimes you want to have a little bit of fun and say, actually, you know what, it's right that this text pushes our system and challenges it, and we break it for this reason. So I guess intention and research is what holds that balance between system and process. Super, super interesting. I really, I really like that. That this is the the note we're ending on, like to, to think our, and challenge ourselves in, in thinking about projects and pushing ourselves and, and, and using these other scenarios to perhaps uh, uh, question our own methodologies and, 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 and expand uh, and grow, uh, certainly in, in, in design. Uh, that's imperative to, to keep growing. I think that's the expectation. So I think like, it's, a, it's a really healthy way of looking at things. Um, thank you so, so much. This has been like a wonderful eye-opening uh, presentation. I hope everyone watching uh, has had a lot of uh, buzzing in, in, in their minds and hopefully your, your um, browser is filled with open tabs that you will uh, uh, be, be looking through and, 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 and going through perusing. Uh, don't forget this, this lecture is, is going to be archived. You could, you could watch replay sections, especially the more technical portions, which I really appreciate that, that Rathan, you, you brought that technical element to it and, and generosity in sharing that, that insight. It's, it's often sometimes maybe held back, but I really appreciate it because I think it helps us all grow and, 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 and in, in sort of in, in connecting the world in, in this amazing sort of way. So thank you again so much. And thank well, you. Thank you. For, and thank you for bringing us together in a really, really difficult in, in, in a time, you know, where we really seek to connect and, and feel human and remember what our purpose is. And, and, you know, thank you for that generosity of hosting all of us. Uh, it's been amazing. And, and thank you to the generosity of people who give off their time. I think that's been really, really amazing to say that you came here and supported and, and, and uh, held us together. And hopefully we'll have a beer at Cooper Tight at some point. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I, I really look forward to, to seeing everyone uh, in person some, sometime real soon. So, uh, you know, as always, the closing to, to stay safe and to, to keep healthy to everyone and their families. And uh, we'll, we'll get through this uh, and, and let's be generous with each other. So. Uh, with that, we'll close and thank you, everyone. Have a great evening, morning, uh, afternoon, wherever you are. So, thank you, Rathna, again. Thank you.